Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the AP Physics 1 video series. Today we're going to walk you through circular motion and gravity. I'll be referring to it as UCM. You'll see later on why. As always, we have our little disclaimer here that these lessons are created for AP Physics 1 and will differ from regular grade physics. These videos are also as concise and as clear as possible so that you can get the lesson across in a fast-ish time. Please do look through your textbooks and what your teacher has provided you for more material. Before we get started, here's a quick hello from who is delivering you this material. Alex, that's me on the left, I'm doing this video here, and Esther on the right is in charge of all the lovely practice problems you will see in this video. Table of contents. First, we're going to go through uniform circular motion, UCM. This is why I do call it UCM. Tangential velocity and acceleration are the key points to that for a section. Then we move on to planetary laws, especially Kepler's laws of universal gravitation. Finally, we're going to end off with gravitation and orbits. So talking about gravitational fields and orbital dynamics. Of course, there are going to be practice problems as we go. Here are the concepts you will need to know for our first section of UCM. Centripetal force, tangential velocity, and centripetal acceleration. I'll explain these real quick. Let's take a look at a Hot Wheels track. I hope everyone here knows what a Hot Wheels track is. If not, they're just little toy cars that circle around in these loops. This is a great demonstration of UCM. UCM is circular motion, so you don't have to think about it as just planets. What we have here are vertical loops, as well as horizontal circles. UCM deals with circles. We'll get to ellipses and other sh circular shapes later on with planets, however, with most of your questions on AP Physics 1, it'll just be regular circles. So what's the difference here between the vertical and horizontal circular paths of motion? Well, let's take a look. Let's say our object is one of these cars here. Choose your favorite. Now, vertical circles here have a center. And same with horizontal circles. That is where your radius stems from. So we're back to regular algebra here, or math, as you should know it. If you don't know, watch the, the uh, circle song on YouTube. Now, your car will be experiencing different forces at different times throughout its motion in the circle. We're going to look specifically at three points. This point at the very top, at the maximum height you can reach, this point here at the very bottom, the minimal point you can reach, and somewhere along the middle. Doesn't matter which side you put this dot on, it could be over here, it could be over here. Doesn't really matter. And then for our horizontal circle, essentially all the points are the same, so we're just only going to be looking at one point. All right. Here, what I have done is list out the three main concepts that we are going to go through today. First up, we have centripetal force, which we use Fc for, and it's the force that causes the object to travel in a circular motion. This is not a new force. as you'll see in a moment. Centripetal acceleration, AC, is the acceleration in a circular motion caused by the force, because we know that whenever there's a force, there has to be an acceleration. Tangential velocity is the velocity in a linear motion. You're thinking, wait, we're moving in a circular motion. Why is there any linear components? Let's take a look at this vertical circle for now. This vertical circle, if we're going to look at the points here, we know that 
mass. For example, if it were to sit on a table and we have a little car, we would have force of gravity acting on it as well as a normal force holding it up. If it's moving, you'd have an applied force and the tires may experience friction. Well, if it's at the bottom of this track here, that's what it's experiencing. If it's to stay stagnant and just right here, it's not moving at all, we would only have the normal force and the gravitational force where they are the same. My video kind of ran into problems at this point. So this is just a little stick in here. Anyways, if we're looking at this point over here, what we would have is your force of gravity always downwards. However, your normal force is always, always, always perpendicular to the surface, which means if we're here, our normal force would still be over here. And we would be, you can't stay stagnant then here at this point, which means you either have an applied force in this direction, keeping you up, or the different components, the different vector components of the normal force is holding you up. Don't worry, we'll return to the normal video soon. Here, what we do have is our force of gravity again as well as our normal force in the same direction so what is keeping you up is on the track now there's different forces that apply there for vertical circles the only times where you will have this is either when a roller coaster or a car is on top of the maximal point or when you have a string attached to the object and you're swinging it around and i'll talk about that I'll continue to talk about that in the video which we'll cut into right now so i'm going to draw it from a bird's eye view we can have any point on here really as all of these points are on the same plane so they're equally valid if we have a car racing around, it's actually quite easy for the car to travel using a tangential velocity, as we sit down here, in a linear motion, which means it will just speed off like so. This is why we need our centripetal force. We need the force to pull the car to the middle. Let's pretend there's an invisible force line. And it's like a string that keeps the car attached onto this circular track. If you ever take something on a string and swing it around, you'll know what I'm talking about. Now, whenever we have velocity, we have acceleration, unless it is a constant velocity and it states in the problem. We do have a force and we know when there's a force, there's an acceleration. Your centripetal acceleration follows the line of force. Actually, let's denote this as FC so we are more clear. Your AC would run along the same line. There's a formula for all of these and I'll jot them down right now. Now for units, our velocity is often in meters per second. For acceleration, of course, meters per second squared. For R, the radius, that'd be meters. For T, time period, we'd set up here, seconds. And of course, force is in newtons. And M is in kilograms. We use metric units for physics. This is all very important 
for everything else later on. So now I'm going to talk a bit more about the horizontal circle. If it is a string attached to a point, you would have a tension force. And the tension force would be your centripetal force. If instead you were to be a car traveling around, you would be held back by frictional force. So it does depend on the question what type of force you are experiencing. If we were to look at a car head on, that's or any object actually, that is traveling around a circle, perhaps it's on a steep bank. What are the forces that are applied to it? Well, we know we have the force of gravity. And please, 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 please do not draw it like so. Straight down is our force of gravity. However, we are on a bank, so our Fn force is always perpendicular to the surface, which means the Fn and the Fg are not completely equal. Looking at our vector arrows, we would need this component of Fn, which you can call Fny to be equal to fg. That's moving on to more vector components later, which we don't need to worry about right now. If you were to travel in a circular motion, we know you would need a fc. And so the fc would always, again, point to a hypothetical middle in the center of the circle. Here is our practice problem. A ball is attached to a string that is 1.5 meters long spun around so that it completes two full cycles every second. What is the centripetal acceleration felt by the ball? We know that AC equals V squared over R, which means in order to find AC, we need to first find the velocity and the radius. Well, we know the radius already. It's the string that is 1.5 meters long. And we know that the formula for velocity, 2 pi r over t. We already have all the variables on the top. What is t? Well, we know that it completes two full rotations every second, which means one rotation per half a second. So our t would equal 0 0.5. Plug that into your calculator, and then stick this in. Remember to square your velocity. In the end, you should have an answer Remember, we need to round to significant digits, and we have two here in the question, so we need to round to two for our answer. There are three laws that make up Kepler's planetary laws. Number one, planets move around the sun in elliptical orbits, which we should all know by now. Number two, the straight lines joining the sun and a given planet sweeps out equal areas in equal amounts of time, so equal areas in equal intervals of time. This also brings us to the law of conservation of energy, which you should have heard of before. If not, that's completely fine. The third law is that the square of a period of revolution of a planet about the sun is directly proportional to the cube of its average distance from the sun. I don't know if I had a voice crack there or something. Pardon that. What we call our model of the Earth, a, we call it a heliocentric, heliocentric model. 
which means the sun is in the middle. That looks more like a flower than the sun. Oh, well. And our elliptical orbit has Earth right there. Let's say that's Earth. Cute little planet. Let's say this is the top view. And the sun is over here. I'm actually going to draw it as a flower now. It's just cute. And we have our planet here. What we have is a range, per se. Let's say the planet moves from here to here. And this, the sun, acts as our pivot point of the elliptical. So it's very off-centered. And if we join the straight lines joining the sun in a given planet, here sweeps out equal areas in equal intervals of time. So let's say that's an area. And right here, if we were to travel from here to here, the areas would be the same. At the sun, at this pivotal point, what we have is we feel gravitational pull. And so what happens is this planet, we'll just call it Earth, when it is closer to the sun, it moves at a faster kinetic energy. When it's further away from the sun, it is slower kinetic energy. And then the opposite occurs here, it has less potential energy. Here, it has more potential energy. Because we know from the law of conservation of energy that the total energy... Oh, that is, a, that is not how you spell total. My apologies. This is not English AP anyways. It's fine. The total amount of energy in a system is equal to the potential energy plus the kinetic energy at all times. What about the third point here? The square of a period of revolution of a planet above the sun is directly proportional to the cube of its average distance from the sun. That becomes really handy when you are faced with a graph. Physics 1 loves to throw graphs at you, so know your graphs. If we have r cubed versus t squared, and they're directly proportional, that means we just have a linear line. Perfect. I do want to talk about the forces here and how the different tangential velocities affect the rotation of the planet, similar to how we did some Hot Wheels up there. Let's say we had our orbit. I guess this looks more like the sun than before. <laughs> Here's our orbit. And let's put these planets at different points. Now we know that their centripetal force, Fc, will be a straight line joining the sun and their location. Oh, that is definitely not uh, <laughs> joining. Okay, awesome. But what about velocity and acceleration, like we said before? Because we know from earlier that Fc relies especially on the tangential velocity. Well, here, again, remember when I talked about horizontal circles and how we always have tangential velocity here, that applies right here. So if our cycle is rotating this way, then the tangential velocity of the planets would simply be straight lines going and following like this. And we know that there's an equal and opposite force for, well, each force. 
which means the centripetal force here from the planet is equal to a force given out by the sun, the equal and opposite force right there. All right, perfect. What's the next slide? Okay. Perfect. Three, two, one. So we're going to move on. I did already talk about velocity and energy areas. So now we're going to look at Newton's laws. And I did talk about graphs. However, we still have one more graph to talk about. Newton's law of universal gravitation. Because, you know, Newton loves making laws. Fg, which we all know on Earth, is our 9.81 meters per second squared. Or some people say 10 meters per second squared. The way we calculate this on different planets that are not Earth is to take a gravitational constant, g, and g equals 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 and it's units here it's a it's a mouthful newton meters squared per kilogram squared so g m1 m2 and m we know is mass but what is what is 1 and 2 well universal gravitation it's always between two objects here we saw the example of planet and sun. It could be between two different planets. So M1 equals one object, of course the mass. M2 equals different object. Over the radius squared. And Hopefully, yes, again, we know what radius is. The force and the distance are related. Which you see up here, right? In an elliptical orbit, the forces here are different than the forces here. What we get is this nice constant curve, like so. Of course, Perhaps on a couple of questions, they will give you more specific numbers for the force and the distance, but your general trend should look like a downwards curve. Moving on to gravitation and orbits. A little bit of orbital dynamics here as well. These are the main concepts you'll need to know. The gravitational constant, which I did state above before, and the gravitational field, not a number, but a concept. As we know, Earth has a gravitational field. This is Earth. And let's say perhaps everything within this range is susceptible to gravity. That would be the gravitational field. Ooh, that was satisfying. Okay. We know forces always occur in pairs. Which means if I have a planet here, and I have another planet here, perhaps a bigger one, they will exert a force on each other, equal and opposite. This gives us the relative gravitational fields of each planet. Now, intuitively, the smaller the planet, the smaller the gravitational field will be compared to a larger planet, which will definitely have a larger gravitational field. That was really messy. They look like scrambled eggs. doesn't matter. What we need to know here is that G, the gravitational field, equals the gravitational force divided by the mass of the object. We can also write that as with the gravitational constant as g m2 over r squared. And you're thinking, okay, why m1 m2? 
the question might give you one mass, and it might look for the other mass, vice versa. So M1, M2, and it doesn't really matter as long as they are different masses. Field direction and field magnitude, when you do draw them on perhaps a question or a test, they need to be equal in all directions. If you drew something like this, good luck getting a point. How does this work? How does this tie into our physics here? Well, there are many, 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 many questions where it will give you, as we say up here, two different planets, and it gives you perhaps the distance. Oh, that is a highlighter. The distance between these two planets, and let's suppose it's 15 meters. Let's suppose the different masses. So M1 would equal 100 kilograms. And M2 would equal 300 kilograms. And it can ask you, what is the net gravitational at the point halfway through? Okay, let me get rid of all the unwanted things here. So you should probably keep the formula, but you probably have it down already. It's on your formula sheet. Okay, let's write it. So, we know this here would have to be G1. This here would have to be G2 because there are two different planets, two different gravitational forces. And so, we it's really easy here. If we go G1 equals G M1 for R squared and g2 equals g m2 over r squared. Pause the video here if you know how to solve for this. I'm going to continue. The value you should get for here is approximately 1.1857 times 10 to the negative 10. And because it's a vector, we know that here it's going in the left direction. For gravitational field number two, you should approximately get 3.557 times 10 to the negative 10, and this time we're going right. Fantastic. Your questions will often ask you for specific planets. And the formula sheet will give you masses and radiuses of specific planets as you go. Awesome, so here's a practice problem. A new planet is discovered with a math, math, we're not doing math, with a mass 3.21 times 10 to the 23 kilograms and a diameter of 8.53 times 10 to the 3 kilometers. What is the lowest escape velocity or the lowest tangential velocity required to escape this planet's gravitational pull. So here we already know that is Vt. And this would be one of our m values. And diameter, which will give us the radius, because we know d divided by 2 equals radius. And so again, I encourage you here to pause the video, see if you can do it yourself before I reveal the answer. Assuming you were responsible enough to do that, here we go, and I'll uncover the answer. So, first thing, we need to know our formula. We rearrange the different formulas before, and they are formatted a bit different to what we have been doing. This, oh, my pen is not what it's supposed to be. Here we are. This would be our radius, and this would be our mass. And of course, g is the gravitational constant. So what do we do with this? How do we sub the values in? Well, then here you go. That looks like a lot. It is quite intuitive once you do a step-by-step. -step. 
So we know the gravitational constant here. And we know our mass. Now we know our diameter divided by 2 for the radius. And that gives us the answer right here. See, that was more intuitive than you thought it would be. If you have any questions or comments, of course, down in the YouTube description channel, uh, not channel, description comments, or you can hit us up on our Instagrams and we'll be more than happy to help you out. Thanks for watching.